So as, as we are continuing the series in the book of Luke, and we're studying our way through this gospel, we're going to be going through the entire gospel throughout the summer. Um, with that said, is this morning I just want to start with just the opening verses, right, intro, where, where Luke tells us why he wrote this gospel. And again, the gospel is the story of Jesus, right, and, and of his life, and, and all of it that, again, he taught and, and interacted with and, and showed us about God and about the gospel, and again, the good news of Jesus and how we're saved. Again, Luke says in Luke 1, verses 3 and 4, he says, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Again, the point of Luke writing, right, was that we would know what is true about Jesus, that we would clearly understand the gospel and the saving message of his life, right, and that we would um, live that out, right, and that we can trust it and know that it's true. Again, Luke um, is unique in the way he wrote. He was, he's the only Gentile gospel writer in our scriptures. Um, he's, he was a physician, and, and so he, he analyzed things in a different way. And so we see, again, as he kind of explains um, the miracles and interactions and the teachings of Jesus, we see this unique perspective as we're studying through the different uh, chapters and stories of Luke. Uh, we started with Luke 1 and 2 and, and looked at, Again, the, the framing question of those opening chapters is, what is your reaction to Jesus? Right? We saw several different reactions to Jesus in those chapters. And last week, we looked at chapters 3 and 4 uh, and looked at what true identity is, right? That our identity in Christ, right, when we are saved, when we pray and receive him as our Savior and invite him into our life and surrender our heart and, and our will to him, to him and receive grace and mercy, forgiveness and salvation, right? When we do that, that our identity changes. We move from God's creation to God's child, and we are adopted into his family. Right? And then we live into our true identity, which is a son or a daughter of the one true king, right? And, and God is the one who, who uh, defines who we are and our, our core identity. And now as we move in this week to Luke chapters 5 and 6, we, we move into, now, truthfully, we start to see kind of the meat of the gospel. I mean, these, these first four chapters were really intro, kind of, kind of, you know, introducing us to John the Baptist and to Jesus and the birth narratives and the, the genealogies and just kind of all of these things. And now we get to some real uh, interactions with Jesus, right, and his public ministry. And so we're going to uh, uh, see here in these chapters as he calls some of the, all the different disciples, right? Those that we're going to walk with him in the closest relationship and closest teaching, you know, for the next three years um, of his life until he en eventually ends up, of course, as we know, right? Spoiler alert, he ends up on the cross, right? And, and yet we, we learn so much from Jesus about the kingdom of God and about the things of, uh, of God's character and, and what it means to follow him and, and to truly be saved and be transforming God's spirit throughout, um, you know, his teachings. And so, but we're going to, again, look at, at um, Luke chapter, chapter 5. We're going to start here in uh, verses 1 through 11 as we look at the calling of Simon Peter. And Again, this last year, we, we looked at our Easter series this last year, looked at Peter, right, and learned a lot about him and, and the way that, that Jesus anoints him and, and uses him in many different ways. But here we see, right, the, the first, first interactions between Peter and Jesus. So if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to open with me to Luke chapter 5. Uh, if you're with us in person and don't have your own Bible, the Bible's provided for you in the seats you're welcome to use. You'll notice the page number is there where you can find it in those Bibles. If you're with us online, you can grab your Bible as well, or just listen as I read it. But we're going to read uh, Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 11, where it says, One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him and to listen to the word of God. And he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. 
a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish on, on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had been caught, as were the others with him. And his partners, James and John, sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. And now as we see, again, this, this story, right, this interaction, this, this miracle, right, that happens um, with Jesus as he's teaching, you know, the crowds. He's already attracted crowds. And they're, they're, he's already to this place where he's having to kind of manage it, right, and they're kind of pressing in on him. And, and yet Jesus is moving forward in his first task, right, in his public ministry, and that is to gather his disciples, Right, and as he has this interaction, again, with, with Simon Peter, we, we, we see just um, th- this process that Peter goes through, right, to end up following Jesus. Okay, this was not like an instant thing for Peter. Notice that, that he had this, this interaction with Jesus, and, and in fact, it even took this miracle, right, this, this experience that he couldn't explain to get him to, to commit to following Jesus, right, to, to, to changing his life and starting in a new direction, and so this morning, as we start to look at that, as, as, as he's, again, Peter is invited by Jesus, right, into this, this relationship, there, there are different stages, right, that Peter has to go through to get to that level, right, to get to that place where he's ready to commit to Jesus, right, to drop everything and go with him. And we see Peter go through these different stages, Okay, first off, uh, the first thing we see in verse 3 is there's this curiosity about who Jesus is. He's heard some of the the rumors, right, about some of the miracles. The reality is the text doesn't tell us really how much Simon Peter knows about Jesus. Obviously, he already knew about Jesus because there were rumblings, right? I mean, again, the text implies that. But likely... Um, he didn't know much other than just the rumors that are flowing around, right, about this, this man, Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there. And yet we see that Simon Peter was curious enough to at least let Jesus use his boat. Right? And he listened to what Jesus had to say. Yeah, again, even though he had, not, he had no relationship with Jesus, he had not surrendered to him, he had, he, had, there was, he had no idea even what Jesus was about, but yet he was willing to listen. And, and he had this curiosity, and he says, you know what, there's something about Jesus that, that's pulling me towards him, and so I'm, good, I'm at least going to listen. Yeah, and then we see him in verse 5, he, he moves to this kind of next stage, right, of, of him, of this process he's, that Jesus is working through with Simon, right? We see in verse 5 that he kind of pushes back with skepticism. Again, Jesus asks something more of Peter than ever before. Okay, again, he tells Peter to throw down his nets, right? And notice the pushback that Peter gives him, right? He's kind of looking at Jesus like, Jesus, I don't really know who you are, but, but I'm a professional fisherman, right? I've been working all night, right? Like, like if there's no fish to catch, Right? And he, he pushes, kind of pushes back on Jesus a little bit. And again, we see this, right? That, that he, he kind of, he's, he's like, Jesus, I, you, know, you might not know who I am. Right? He kind of pushes back on him a little bit. And, and again, sometimes we do that, don't we? We kind of have that own little arrogance about ourselves. Right? And, and yet we, we see him get to this place, right? And he's like, but... Again, because to him, right, fishing again at that moment made zero sense. Right, like, Jesus, I grew up on this, on this lake, right, on the sea. I, I know how to fish. It made no sense. Right, but he does it, right? He, he throws it down. And then we see the next stage again of this process that Jesus is taking Peter through. In, in verses 6 and 7, Peter gets a taste of God's love and grace. Okay, again, Jesus kind of baits the hook a little, a little more with Peter, right? No pun intended. 
right? And, and, and he gets to say, right, because here's there's, there's this miraculous catch. I mean, and, and it's truly a miraculous catch, right? I mean, so much, right, that it filled two boats to the point where the boats were, were almost sinking, right? Now, again, remember that, that Peter and his buddies, right, and his partners are professional fishermen, Okay, there, there is money to be made with a big catch. In fact, it was their livelihood. I, I don't know if you have um, watched um, the, um, anything. There's this, this app called The Chosen. And if you haven't watched it, I encourage you to download it and watch it. It's free. It's, it's crowd, crowdfunded. You can watch it. And it's a story. It's, I want to think the better, like, dramatically told, you know, stories of Jesus I've ever seen. And again, in The Chosen, it kind of sets this up, all right, and to where, and it kind of sets up the story where Peter is, like, in financial trouble, right, and he's really struggling, and yet, and then Jesus bails him out with his miracle. Okay, now again, the, the text here, especially in Luke, it doesn't, it doesn't give us any of the backstory, okay, but, but we know that this miraculous catch was worth a lot of money. Okay, and this, and this is a lot of money and resources, right, that Peter hadn't earned, he was given it by Jesus. He gets a taste of God's love and grace. And then we see as, as the story continues, right, into verse 8, um, Peter suddenly is aware of his own depravity. Okay, we see an awareness of his own depravity. Now, depravity, this is a word. This is a scholarly Word and so, but I, I give it to you to say that I think this is the best word to describe what happens here with Peter. Okay, this what this word depravity, this theological term means, right? Is is the the fact that we fall short of God's glory. It's, it's the depravity is the realization that that God is God and He is holy and I'm not. I fall short of that standard. In fact, if you read in, in Romans, right, it says, for all have sinned and fall short, short of God's glorious standard. Okay, and in fact, that verse is the literal definition of depravity. Yeah, and this, in this moment, and we see, right, where, where Peter literally makes a, a, a huge turn in his perspective, in his attitude, in his interaction with Jesus, right? I mean, literally just moments before he's pushing back on Jesus in a little bit of arrogance, right, about, okay, Jesus, I mean, I'm the, I'm the fisherman, like, you're not, and, but if, if you tell me to fit, whatever, right? And, then, and now he gets a complete turn, right, to where now he's saying, Jesus, I am not worthy to be in your presence. Right, and not only does he realize the power and the holiness of, of Jesus, right, and, and, and that, that God's embodied in the, him as the Messiah, but he also realizes how, fall, how, how he falls short of that. And he's not worthy to be there. Again, it's that moment where he realizes, I do not deserve what you've just given me. And, and in fact, it would be more comfortable for me if you would just leave. Right? And, and again, we've, all, we, we've felt that before too, haven't we? Right? That now as we work through this process that, that God's pulling us out of our comfort zone, right? And he's like, Lord... I realize now your power, I realize your holiness, and I realize how, how short I fall, and it would be better, more comfortable for me, right, to just walk away. And it would be, right, but it would also be the worst decision you'd ever make. Yeah, we see again, as Jesus is walking Peter through this process, right, he realizes his own depravity in verse 8, and then we see in verse 9, he finds a newfound reverence for Jesus. Right, because even in the midst of this realization, right, as Peter makes this, um, God, Jesus' love for him doesn't stop. See, see, Jesus doesn't do what Peter asks of him. Right, Peter says, no, just, just get away, right, like, like, I'm not worthy of this, right? And, and Jesus doesn't stop the, the, the pressure, right? Jesus continues to pursue that to where Peter starts to, to realize, right, that, wow, even, even with my depravity, and even when Jesus knows that, right, that I fall short, right, he continues to, to give me grace. 
and he continues to love me, right? And, and, and then the response, right, the natural response of that love and that grace from God is reverence, right, is to love him back. With not just a, a, a love, but a respect, right, and, and, and a surrender, right? Because reverence is a lot more than respect, right? Reverence is more than just, again, loving God back. Love, reverence includes an awe, right, an obedience, right, a surrendering, right, a, 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 a realizing, right, my, my place and my role that God is God and that I am not, and my response, right, is, is one of praise, right, and, and, and all of those things encumber into reverence for Jesus. And we, and we see that start to, to, to play out here in, in Peter's heart and mind and, 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 it, and even in his interactions. And, and then we see uh, in verse 10 that he then receives instructions for new direction. Okay, that Jesus walks him through this process and now he gives him new directions in life, right? This is where Jesus says, hey, guess what? Like, I know you are a good fisherman, right? A, a, amidst, you know, the coming up empty last night, and then, you know, coming through all this, he's like, I get that, but guess what? Now, you're not going to fish for fish anymore, right? Now, you're going to fish for men, right? And Jesus gives him instructions for a new direction in his life, a new purpose in his life, right? He says, you're, again, the, what you're living for now is no longer just to, to make ends meet, right, through, through fishing, Okay, now you will move in a new direction. Right, and then we see in verse 11, right, where, where this, this process that, that, that Jesus takes Peter through and it completes, right? And it completes with commitment. Right, of where it says that, that, that Peter, right, and James and John, that they, they dropped their nets, they, they left their business behind, and they followed Jesus. They were all in. Right? In this moment, there's, there's no turning back, right? And when we look at this process, these stages of commitment that Peter works through, right, with Jesus right in front of him as Jesus takes him through this, we, we recognize this process because this process can apply to any commitment or change in our lives even today. Again, this might be a similar process that you went through in finding Jesus for the first time. Hey, this might um, you know, be a process that you can identify with, right? Maybe you're in the middle of this right now in your life, right? You might be looking at this and saying, wow, like, I get this, right? Now, again, we can, let's kind of step the, the, the spiritual, spiritual side of this apart and, and to say, again, this process, we, this is a common thing we work through a lot of ways in our lives, right? Again, think about um, this example, right, of when you want to decide that I'm going to lose weight, Right, and when we make that decision that I'm going to lose weight, right, we, we start, you know, with some curiosity, right? We're like, okay, like, you know, how do I lose weight, right? And we start to look into our diet, right, and, and we kind of decide, right, that maybe my diet's close enough to a good one. Right, and, and again, and then, you know, but maybe we're curious enough, or say, okay, we're going to, you know, but we push back on some skepticism, like, no, this is okay, right? And then we get a little bit of taste, right, of, of, of we lose that first pound, and, and we kind of work it. Then, then in the middle of the process, we realize our own depression. So as, as we are continuing the series in the book of Luke, and we're studying our way through this gospel, we're going to be going through the entire gospel throughout the summer. Um, with that said, is this morning I just want to start with just the opening verses, right, intro, where, where Luke tells us why he wrote this gospel. And again, the gospel is the story of Jesus, right, and, and of his life and, and all that, that, again, he taught and, and interacted with and, and showed us about God and about the gospel and, again, the good news of Jesus and how we're saved. Again, Luke says in Luke 1, verses 3 and 4, he says, "...having carefully investigated everything from the beginning..." I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Again, the point of Luke writing, right, was that we would know what is true about Jesus. That we would clearly understand the gospel and the saving message of his life, right, and that we would um, live that out, right, and that we can trust it and know that it's true. 
Again, Luke um, is unique in the way he wrote. He was, he's the only Gentile gospel writer in our scriptures. Um, he's, he was a physician, and, and so he, he analyzed things in a different way. And so we see, again, as he kind of explains um, the miracles and interactions and the teachings of Jesus, we see this unique perspective as we're studying through the different uh, chapters and stories of Luke. Uh, we started with Luke 1 and 2 and, and looked at, again, the, the framing question of those opening chapters is, what is your reaction to Jesus? Right, we saw several different reactions to Jesus in those chapters. And then last week, we looked at chapters 3 and 4 uh, and looked at what true identity is, right? That our identity in Christ, right, when we are saved, when we pray and receive him as our Savior and invite him into our life and surrender our heart and, and our will to him, to him and receive grace and mercy and forgiveness and salvation, right? When we do that, that our identity changes. We move from God's creation to God's child, and we are adopted into his family. And then we live into our true identity, which is a son or a daughter of the one true king, right? And, and God is the one who, who uh, defines who we are and our, our core identity. And now as we move in this week to Luke chapters 5 and 6. We, we move into, now, truthfully, we start to see kind of the meat of the gospel. I mean, these, these first four chapters were really intro, kind of, kind of, you know, introducing us to John the Baptist and to Jesus and the birth narratives and the, the genealogies and just kind of all of these things. And now we get to some real uh, interactions with Jesus, right, and his public ministry. And so we're going to uh, uh, see here in these chapters as he calls some of the, all the different disciples, right? Those that we're going to walk with him in the closest relationship and closest teaching, you know, for the next three years um, of his life until he en eventually ends up, of course, as we know, right? Spoiler alert, he ends up on the cross, right? And, and yet we, we learn so much from Jesus about the kingdom of God and about the things of, uh, of God's character and, and what it means to follow him and, and to truly be saved and be transformed by God's spirit throughout, um, you know, his teachings. And so, but we're going to, again, look at, at um, Luke chapter, chapter 5. We're going to start here in uh, verses 1 through 11 as we look at the calling of Simon Peter. And Again, this last year, we, we looked at our Easter series this last year, looked at Peter, right, and learned a lot about him and, and the way that, that Jesus anoints him and, and uses him in many different ways. But here we see, right, the, the first, first interactions between Peter and Jesus. So if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to open with me to Luke chapter 5. Uh, if you're with us in person and don't have your own Bible, or Bible's provided for you in the seats you're welcome to use. You'll notice the page numbers there where you can find it in those Bibles. If you're with us online, you can grab your Bible as well or just listen as I read it. But we're going to read uh, Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 11, where it says, One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him and then to listen to the word of God. And he noticed two empty boats that, at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish on, on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had been caught, as were the others with him. And his partners, James and John, sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. And now as we see, again, this, this story, right, this interaction, this, this miracle, right, that happens um, with Jesus as he's teaching you know, the crowds, he's already attracted crowds. They're, 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 he's already to this place where he's having to kind of manage it, right? And they're kind of pressing in on him. And, and yet Jesus is moving forward in his first task, right? In his public ministry, and that is to gather his disciples. 
right? And as he has this interaction again with, with Simon Peter, we, we, we see just um, this, this process that Peter goes through, right, to end up following Jesus. Okay, this was not like an instant thing for Peter. Notice that, that he had this, this interaction with Jesus. And, and in fact, it even took this miracle, right? This, this experience that he couldn't explain to get him to, to commit to following Jesus, right? To, to, to changing his life and starting in a new direction. And so this morning, as we start to look at that, as, as, as he's, again, Peter is invited by Jesus, right, into this, this relationship, there, there are different stages, right, that Peter has to go through to get to that level, right, to get to that place where he's ready to commit to Jesus, right, to drop everything and go with him. And we see Peter go through these different stages. Okay, first off, uh, the first thing we see in verse 3 is there's this curiosity about who Jesus is. He's heard some of the, the rumors, right, about some of the miracles. The reality is the text doesn't tell us really how much Simon Peter knows about Jesus. Obviously, he already knew about Jesus because there were rumblings, right? I mean, the, again, the text implies that. But likely, um, he didn't know much other than just the rumors that are flowing around, right, about this, this man, Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there. And yet we see that Simon Peter was curious enough to at least let Jesus use his boat. Right? And he listened to what Jesus had to say. Right? Again, even though he had, not, he had no relationship with Jesus, he had not surrendered to him, he had, he, had, there was, he had no idea even what Jesus was about, but yet he was willing to listen. And he had this curiosity, and he says, you know what, there's something about Jesus that, that's pulling me towards him, and so I'm, good, I'm at least going to listen. And then we see him in verse 5, he, he moves to this kind of next stage, right, of, of him, of this process he's, that Jesus is working through with Simon. Right? We see in verse 5 that he kind of pushes back with skepticism. Again, Jesus asked something more of Peter than ever before. Again, he tells Peter to throw down his nets, right? And notice the pushback that Peter gives him, right? He's kind of looking at Jesus. He's like, Jesus, I don't really know who you are, but, but I'm a professional fisherman, right? I've been working all night, right? Like, like there's no fish to catch, right? And he, he pushes, kind of pushes back on Jesus a little bit. And again, we see this, right, that, that he, he kind of, he's, he's like, Jesus, I, you know, you might not know who I am. Right, he kind of pushes back on him a little bit. And, and again, sometimes we do that, don't we? We kind of have that own little arrogance about ourselves. Right? And, and yet we, we see him get to this place, right? And he's like, but again, because to him, right, fishing again at that moment made zero sense. Right, like, Jesus, I grew up on this, on this lake, right, on the sea. I, I know how to fish. It made no sense. Right, but he does it, right? He, he throws it down. And then we see the next stage again of this process that Jesus is taking Peter through. In, in verses 6 and 7, Peter gets a taste of God's love and grace. Yeah, again, Jesus kind of baits the hook a little, a little more with Peter, right? No pun intended. Right, and, and, and he gets to say, right, because here's there's, there's this miraculous catch. I mean, and it's truly a miraculous catch, right? I mean, so much, right, that it filled two boats to the point where the boats were, were almost sinking. Right, now again, remember that, that Peter and his buddies, right, and his partners are professional fishermen. Okay, there, there is money to be made with a big catch. In fact, it was their livelihood. I, I don't know if you have um, watched um, the, um, anything. There's this, this app called The Chosen. And if you haven't watched it, I encourage you to download it and watch it. It's free. It's, it's crowd, crowdfunded. You can watch it. And it's the story. It's, I want to think the better, like, dramatically told, you know, stories of Jesus I've ever seen. And, and again, in The Chosen, it kind of sets this up, all right? And to where, and it, it kind of sets up the story where Peter is, like, in financial trouble. 
right? And he's really struggling, and yet, and then Jesus bails him out with his miracle. They, now, again, the, the text here, especially in Luke, it doesn't, it doesn't give us any of the backstory. Okay? But, but we know that this miraculous catch was worth a lot of money. Yeah, and this, and this is a lot of money and resources, right, that Peter hadn't earned. He was given it by Jesus. He gets a taste of God's love and grace. And then we see as, as the story continues, right, into verse 8, um, Peter suddenly is aware of his own depravity. Okay, we see an awareness of his own depravity. Now, depravity, this is a word. This is a scholarly word. And so, but I, I give it to you to say that I think this is the best word to describe what happens here with Peter. Okay, this, what this word depravity, this theological term means, right, is, is the, the fact that we fall short of God's glory. It's, it's the depravity is the realization that, that God is God and he is holy and I'm not. I fall short of that standard. In fact, if you read in, in Romans, right, it says, for all have sinned and fall short, short of God's glorious standard. Okay, and in fact, that verse is the literal definition of depravity. Yeah, and this, in this moment, and we see, right, where, where Peter literally makes a, a, a huge turn in his perspective, in his attitude, in his interaction with Jesus, right? I mean, literally just moments before he's pushing back on Jesus in a little bit of arrogance, right? About, okay, Jesus, I mean, I'm the, I'm the fisherman, like, you're not, and, but if, if you tell me to fit, whatever, right? And, then, and now he gets a complete turn, right, to where now he's saying, Jesus, I am not worthy to be in your presence, Right? And not only does he realize the power and the holiness of, of Jesus, right, and, and, and that, that God is embodied in him as the Messiah, but he also realizes how, fall, how, how he falls short of that, and he's not worthy to be there. Again, it's that moment where he realizes, I do not deserve what you've just given me, and, and in fact, it would be more comfortable for me if you would just leave. Right? And, and again, we've, all, we, we've felt that before too, haven't we? Right? That now as we work through this process that, that God's pulling us out of our comfort zone, right? And you're just like, Lord, I, I realize now your power, I realize your holiness, and I realize how, fa- how short I fall, and it would be better, more comfortable for me, right, to just walk away. And it would be, right? But it would also be the worst decision you'd ever make. Yeah, we see again as Jesus is walking Peter through this process, right? He realizes his own depravity in verse 8. And then we see in verse 9, he finds a newfound reverence for Jesus. Right? Because even in the midst of this realization, right? As Peter makes this, um, God, Jesus' love for him doesn't stop. See, see, Jesus doesn't do what Peter asks of him. Right? Peter says, no, just... just Get away, right? Like, like, I'm not worthy of this, right? And, and Jesus doesn't stop the, the, the pressure, right? Jesus continues to pursue. Right? To where Peter starts to, to realize, right, that, wow, even, even with my depravity, and even when Jesus knows that, right, that I fall short, right, he continues to, to give me grace. And he continues to love me, right? And, and, and then the response, right? The natural response of that love and that grace from God is reverence, right? Is to love him back. With not just a, a, a love, but a respect. Right? And, and, and a surrender. Right? Because reverence is a lot more than respect. Right? Reverence is more than just, again, loving God back. Love, reverence includes an awe, right, an obedience, right, a surrendering, right, a, 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 a realizing, right, my, my place and my role that God is God and that I am not, and my response, right, is, is one of praise. Right, and, and, and all of those things encumber into reverence for Jesus. 
And we, and we see that start to, to, to play out here in, in Peter's heart and mind and, 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 it, and even in his interactions. And, and then we see uh, in verse 10 that he then receives instructions for new direction. Okay, that Jesus walks him through this process and now he gives him new directions in life, right? This is where Jesus says, hey, guess what? Like, I know you are a good fisherman, right? Amidst, you know, the coming up empty last night and then, you know, coming through all this, he's like, I get that, but guess what? Now you're not going to fish for fish anymore, right? Now you're going to fish for men, right? And Jesus gives him instructions for a new direction in his life, a new purpose in his life. He right, says, you're, again, the, what you're living for now is no longer just to, to make ends meet, right, through, through fishing. Okay, now you will move in a new direction. Right, and then we see in verse 11, right, where, where this, this process that, that, that Jesus takes Peter through and, and it completes, right, and it completes with commitment, right, of where it says that, that, that Peter, right, and James and John, that they, they dropped their nets, they, they left their business behind, and they followed Jesus. They were all in. Right? In this moment, there's, there's no turning back, right? And when we look at this process, these stages of commitment that Peter works through, right, with Jesus, right in front of him, as Jesus takes him through this, we, we recognize this process because this process can apply to any commitment or change in our lives even today. Again, this might be a similar process that you went through in finding Jesus for the first time. Hey, this might um, you know, be a process that you can identify with, right? Maybe you're in the middle of this right now in your life, right? You might be looking at this and saying, wow, like I get this, right? Now, again, we can, let's kind of step the, the, the spiritual, spiritual side of this apart and, and to say, again, this process, we, this is a common thing we work through a lot of ways in our lives, right? Again, think about um, the, this example, right, of when you want to decide that I'm going to lose weight, Right, and when we make that decision that I'm going to lose weight, right, we, we start, you know, with some curiosity, right? We're like, okay, like, you know, how do I lose weight, right? And we start to look into our diet, right, and, and we kind of decide, right, that maybe my diet's close enough to a good one. Right, and, and again, and then, you know, but maybe we're curious enough or say, okay, we're going to, you know, but we push back on some skepticism, like, no, this is okay, right? And then we get a little bit of taste, right, of, of, of we lose that first pound and, and we kind of work it. Then, then in the middle of the process, we realize our own depravity, right, and our ability to not follow directions. Right, and yet as we work through that, then we, we eventually either abandon the process, right, or we end up to full commitment. Right? And again, this is a process that we're familiar with. Now, this is a process that we see Jesus take Simon Peter through, right? And this is what it took to get him to that place of complete commitment, right, with Jesus. Now, in the next, later in the chapter, we see where Jesus calls one of the other disciples, okay? In verses 27 through 32, he calls Levi, Okay, now, now Levi, again, Luke, he goes by Levi. This is the same guy who also is called Matthew. Okay, this is the this, this same, same Matthew that wrote the gospel, Matthew. Okay, and so we see here where Jesus um, calls him as a disciple. Now, this interaction with Jesus is completely different than Simon Peter's. Okay, in Luke 5, verse, starting at verse 27. Okay, where he says, Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, he left everything and followed him. And later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with such scum? Right, Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. 
Right, now, now, as we look at the, this calling of Levi, right, and, and, and his response to this invitation of Jesus to follow him, to, to be a disciple, right, we see with, with Simon Peter, there was this huge process that Jesus walked him through. With Simon Peter, there was no process needed, right? For him, for Levi, he didn't need a process. He just needed opportunity. Hey, because notice, as soon as Jesus was there, right, all it took for him was an invitation, and he just dropped everything and went, Right? And again, this, as we look at this experience right, that Levi had, it was completely different than Simon's. Right? There was no process involved at all. There's literally just this one-line invitation, and he walked away from his old life. Right? This was an instant thing for Levi. And yet we look at the, these two men right, that, that ended up at exactly the same place with Jesus. Right? As a disciple of him and, and, and you know, Again, being poured into and transformed by God's Spirit okay, and their time with Jesus. Right? But we also realize that Levi and Simon were very different people. Right? And again, Levi was at a tax collector's booth, right? which means that he was somewhat high up in the chain of command. Okay? He was not the lowest level tax collector. Okay? Levi was a white collar worker in the Roman system. Okay, we know Peter, again, was a blue-collar worker, right? He was a fisherman. Again, and yet, we can look at that, and, and it, it implies, right, that Levi was not satisfied with the life that he had. Although he had found success through it, and it was definitely lucrative, my guess is that Levi didn't like his job. Okay, that he was ready for a new opportunity. Now, Peter loved his job. Right? Peter loved fishing. In fact, he, we know that because... Um, he went right back to it days after the crucifixion. Okay, now again, Levi was wealthy. He had the means and the knowledge to throw together a banquet for Jesus with zero notice. Right? Notice that, right? I mean, he, he walks away from his job, right? He's like, well, what's next, Jesus? He's like, well, we're, gonna, we're going to a banquet. He's like, where is it? He's like, your house. Right? And he's like, Okay. Right, so he, he calls all his friends, right, and he had, he had the means to do that last minute, right, which again implies that he was a man of wealth. Again, Levi was labeled scum by the Pharisees and religious leaders, right, that's the, that's the bulk of the narrative, right, with Levi's calling. Okay, is that, again, they throw this party, and, and the Pharisees and religious leaders, they show up, and they're, they're, because they're following Jesus too, they're also curious, right, and again, as they're following, they, they call Levi scum, and yet it's, it's interesting here that they ask the question of the disciples, right? They go to the disciples and like, why does your teacher do all this, right? And they ask the disciples, and yet the, the interesting thing here is they ask the question of the disciples, and yet who answers the question, right? Jesus does, right? You, you, I can just imagine this situation, right, where, uh, I mean, it's, it's like your first day at a new job, right? Somebody comes and asks you a question, you're like, I have no idea. Right? I mean, they, they come, they ask the disciples, and they're like, Jesus? Right? And Jesus then answers the question. Right? Then this is what Jesus tells them. Okay, in verses 31 and 32, it says, Now Jesus answered them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Now, in, in this answer, Jesus is modeling a whole new paradigm of what discipleship means. Again, it's one of association, not separation. Right? And he, again, he's telling them, this is how grace, not works, saves you. Again, remember, who is he telling this to? He's telling this to the religious leaders and the Pharisees, who were all about works all about the letter of the law, right? Levi knew what he needed, and he jumped right in, no questions asked. Complete trust in Jesus and an excitement for a new direction and to change. And yet, again, these religious leaders wanted nothing to do with change. Right? again, Jesus is telling them, he's like, no, I have come to save those that want to be saved. Right? And that's the same mission that Jesus has today. That mission has not changed. 
right? Whether you're more like Simon Peter or you're more like Levi, right? Or somewhere in between, the mission of Jesus has not changed. Right? And we have to ask ourselves in that question, right? Is when I look at my own spiritual journey, am I more like Simon or am I more like Levi? Right? Am I stuck in the process somewhere, right, that's holding me back from commitment? Or am I ready to jump right in with both feet and never look back? Hey, now this obviously applies to your salvation, right? You receiving Christ your Savior for the first time, joining the journey of faith. Okay, and I think 100%, again, if, if, you're, if you're here or if you're watching online and you're somewhere in the middle of that process with God, maybe you're just curious, right? And if that's true, you're just starting that, then we're glad you're here. Right, and we want you to continue to, to pursue and ask questions and find out who God is and what Jesus has done for you. Right, continue in that process. Okay, if, if maybe you're in that process, right, or maybe you're not, maybe you're hearing the gospel, or you're, you're hearing just like Levi, and you're ready to jump in. And if you're ready to jump in, then, then, then today's the day of salvation. Right? And, and you, can, you can pray and receive Christ as your Savior and invite him into your life and receive his love and grace and mercy and forgiveness today. Right? But it's not just about salvation. We also have to ask this question, right? Because this is true with every change in our life. As, as God continues to transform our heart and our mind and change the way we think, and, and, and as we move forward in our faith and, and become more like Christ tomorrow than we are today, is, is this same thing is true, right? Either we're ready for the change or we'll jump right in or we kind of push back on Jesus a little bit, don't we? We're like, God, I'm willing to, to, you know, to go this far, but, but not that. Right? I'm not willing to sacrifice that part of my life, right? Or that habitual sin or that attitude or that platform or fill in the blank. Right? And the reality is that God is asking you to move forward in your faith. Just like he pursued the disciples, he's pursuing you, right? And he's inviting you to a new life. Right? And that's true whether you are a believer or not yet a believer in Jesus. He's inviting you to be more like him, to submit to his power, to his spirit, to his love, and his grace, and he wants to transform your heart. And the reality, we learn in 1 Corinthians 12, 6, right, that God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. Again, my spiritual journey is going to look different than yours, right, but it's the same God, right? Again, Jesus is the destination of all of our spiritual journeys. Again, what hangs me up is, might be different than what hangs you up in your spiritual journey, right, but it's the same God. Right? And his power is at work in you. And then we see um, later in Luke chapter 6, uh, verses 12 uh, through 16, is where we learn who makes the cut. Right? It's literally the most exhaustive list in all of scripture of the 12 disciples. Yeah, they, but I, I just want to, though, look at that. Um, again, Luke 6, look at verse 12. It says, one day soon afterwards, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. And then at daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles, and here are their names. Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who is called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Right, and there's the ones that made the cut, right? Those are the ones that, that Jesus calls. But the interesting thing about this passage, right, is, is Jesus' final step. Right? Did you notice, again, at the beginning, verse 12, right, that Jesus prayed before making a final decision? He didn't just, you know, hey, Lord, will you show me? No, he says he prayed all night. <laughs> right? I mean, Jesus knew the weight of this decision. Right? And so again, this is again where Jesus models for us what it looks like to, to truly be surrendered to God. Right? In every decision we make, we need to pray. Again, we realize right, that there were more options, obviously, right, than the 12 that Jesus called. 
Again, just as we saw with Simon and Levi, this is a mixed bag of guys. But they were all pursued and picked by Jesus because they were ready to learn and change. Again, Jesus told Simon that he would make him a fisher of men. Levi was already bringing people to Jesus on the very first day. Different styles, different personalities, same mission. Again, the reality is that Jesus has expanded this list, right, of disciples. And in fact, that was exactly the point, right, was to expand this list of disciples for God's will is to save the world, right? Is that every person will be on this list of disciples. And that's exactly what, what Jesus did, right, as he passed the baton onto the apostles and eventually onto us through the Great Commission. Again, same God, same purpose, same mission, and it's still true today. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Again, this mission has not changed. Right? And that is still, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is still your mission. This is our mission as the church. Right? And again, to make disciples. Right? That's what Jesus did here with his 12. Right? That's what we learn about all of those things. And that's exactly what we're still supposed to be doing today. And so again, if, if you have never received Christ as your Savior, I want you to know today right, that God loves you. That God is pursuing you and he's inviting you to a new life. If you have received Christ as your Savior, then God is still loving, he's still pursuing you, and he's still inviting you to a new life of transformation as you continue to grow and move forward in your faith journey. Right? And are you doing what God's telling you to do? Are you, are you, are you dropping your nets? Are you leaving the booth? Right? Are, you, are you taking action in your faith and in fulfilling the Great Commission? So this is my final thought this morning, and that is this. You are being pursued and picked by Jesus. That no matter where you are in your life, that is true. You are being pursued and picked by Jesus. Whether you need a long process or a one-time invitation, God wants to save you and to change you. What's the next step of your journey? Again, whatever the next step of your journey is, I encourage you to take it. Commit to that step today. If that's a step of salvation, then pray and invite God into your life and receive him as your Savior. If it's just a step of obedience and discipleship and transformation, then take that step. But whatever the step in your faith journey is, take it. Follow through. Drop your nets. Leave the booth. Lord God, we praise you. God, that your power is at work in our lives and in our world. God, we praise you, God, that we can walk with you. Lord, that we can receive that invitation of love and grace and mercy. God, that we can play a role in your plan to save the world. And I pray, God, that as we go this week, Lord, that we will live out our faith. God, that we won't get caught up, Lord, in our own depravity or, or in our own hesitancy, God. But we will be obedient to you. We will follow through, God, and we will be more like you every day as we grow in our faith. And as we just embrace your love and grace and mercy and provision. God, as we go this week, help us to shine your light and your love in our world. Help us to represent you well in all we do as we continue to grow and be transformed by your spirit. God, we love you. We praise you for loving us and for saving us. Guide us as we go this week. In Jesus' name.